Throw the book at them. Book them. Book them, Dano, right? Hawaii 5 0. Steve McGarrett at the end would tell Danny Williams, Book them, Dano. Murder one. What'd that mean? What does it mean to book them? We got them, right? The bad guy's caught. Throw him in jail. Write it down, what he did. Let's get this thing to trial. Let's put him away. Another bad one off the streets. Good has prevailed once again. Book him. The world's a little bit safer. Kind of nice in Hollywood to watch those shows, right? The Law and Orders, the Hawaii Five O's, or whatever cop lawyer shows you watch. And how almost all the time, in the end, the good guys win, right? It may take a while, and there may be some twists and turns. But in the end, the bad guys are put away, and the world's a little bit safer because of what happened. Book them. But then you look around at the real world, and you say we're not living in a Hollywood dream. And sometimes it seems like just the opposite happens. Bad guys get away with stuff all the time. It seems like the unrighteous flourish and prosper. They get slap on the wrist, if even that. In fact, it sometimes seems like the unchristian things that are going on are almost praised and promoted and exemplified as this is the way it should be. And you just wish God would come and book them. Just judge them. Just open the books and take care of business and let's get down to it. But I suppose then, if we want to go there, we have to realize that we're part of that world too. And when we say, God, come and book them. Book them all. We need to ask ourselves this morning, what about us? Are we so bold as to say, we say we can stand before God and open my book, you're not going to find anything there. Open my book, Lord, and you will see nothing but the holy life I have walked every single hour of every single day. I have never strayed from you once. Open my books, Lord, and see just what I've done to please you all the time. So are we going to be like in verse 3 that we just sang? Sinners filled with guilty fears, behold his wrath prevailing. When God comes to open his books on that last day? Now, according to the prophet Daniel, we want to look at his vision this morning in chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, the Old Testament reading. It changes everything. It really allows us to say, Lord, go ahead, open the books. We can't wait to see what's in there. How can we say that? Didn't the psalmist say, O oh Lord, if you kept a record of sins, O oh Lord, who could stand? Yeah, no one, right? If he kept a record of sins. How does that verse continue? But with you, there's forgiveness. Therefore, you're feared. So as we look forward to that last day, as we see the signs of it all around, we take to heart the words of our Savior that we, we lift up our heads for our salvation is drawing nigh. We don't have to run and hide in shame and guilt and fear. We can't wait for the angels to come and gather us around him. Because in Christ Jesus, our names have been written in the book of life. So go ahead. Open the books. Daniel. More than five centuries before Jesus walked the earth with us, the prophet Daniel over in Babylon. And Daniel was given a vision. Daniel was given a dream. Daniel was given a vision of the future. And he saw four great beasts. And these four beasts represented four different kingdoms that were going to come to power between his day and the day when Jesus came to the world some 500 years later. That's the context of chapter 7 here. And the fourth beast, the most powerful of them all, the most intimidating of them all, you look at that beast and certainly you'd think from all worldly perspective that there's no way anyone can defeat this beast. It's like a big Godzilla, right? You watch that movie, who are we little people? Here's this giant beast and it's certainly going to crush us all in its iron teeth and there's no way we can survive. It's just going to leave destruction in its path. And as that fourth beast stands up and starts to boldly, arrogantly declare what he's going to do, we get our verses for today. As I looked, 
Thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. How will Israel survive in the midst of these great beasts? How will the promise of God to send a Savior into the world survive when all these beasts are looking to devour us? He says, and then God came and sat down, and the books were opened. Guess what? He's got it under control. That's pretty comforting to know still today, isn't it? While this specific vision was given for the Israelites at that time and that place, we certainly have comfort in knowing that the Ancient of Days is still the Ancient of Days. And as we look at the world around us, maybe this last Tuesday you went to bed overjoyed at the results of the election. Maybe you didn't. Maybe it's been elections in the past where you just couldn't sleep that night saying, how could people vote for someone like that? And you think, the world is just falling apart. What's going to happen next? How is this place going to survive? And you look around at ISIS in the Middle East, and you look at a resurgent Russia, and you look around at our troops still at war in different parts of the world, and you shake your head and say, I just don't know. It seems like these beasts have their iron teeth out ready to devour us. How are we going to survive? Well, as I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. Guess what? The Ancient of Days still has it all under control. And the promise still remains. All things work for the good of those who love him. There's no need to be afraid. It's comforting to know who our God is and the power our God has. The one who can lift his voice and the earth will melt, as we talked about last week, certainly in the palm of his hand, can guard and protect the world he created and especially his people. We should talk for a second about this whole Ancient of Days concept. This is the only place in the Bible, the book of Daniel, where you hear God called the Ancient of Days. We're starting a new Bible study this morning on different names of God, especially in the book of Genesis. But the, the Ancient of Days is only here in Daniel. You wonder, what is that? What's that all about, the Ancient of Days? You know, very literally, the Ancient One who's been around for days, the, 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 the Aged One. Uh, what's the point? He's been around forever. It's not just your great-grandpa who's been around for a hundred years and has a lot of knowledge. He's been around since there were such a thing as years. Eternal, without beginning, without end. The ancient of days. So not to say he's old in the sense of he's getting arthritis or he needs to go to the doctor more every year or in the sense he's got early onset. No, absolute respect and awe and honor for the one who knows it all, who's seen it all. And he has seen it all. He knows the story of this sin-filled world. He was there when that fruit was eaten in the garden. He was there to see the effect of that on every single human being born of Adam beyond Adam and Eve. He says in Ecclesiastes, there's not a righteous man on earth who does what is right and never sins. You think you get frustrated when you see one thing that happens in our little corner of the world and say, boy, what's going on here? Imagine being the ancient of days and seeing it all even the things that don't make the news, in every corner of the world, from the very beginning. You think you get upset when your kids rebel against you. Imagine every single person in the world is one of your kids who rebels against you. The Ancient of Days has seen it all. The difference, though, you have a great-grandma or great-grandpa who's been around for 90, 100 years, and you sit at their feet and you learn a lot from them. You learn a lot of wisdom. You learn a lot of what they've been through and what they've seen. And without fail, it seems like every great grandma or grandpa will say, things were a lot better in my day. Uh, things are just going down the toilet every year. It gets worse and worse. But let's be honest, great grandma or great grandpa, you've also contributed to that too, haven't you? You haven't exactly been perfect either. You're part of the problem. But not the Ancient of Days. He's the solution to the problem. What we're told here, his clothing was as white as snow. This picture of pure perfection, not a stain or blemish. He takes on human form so that the eyes of Daniel can even look upon him. His hair was as white as wool. And whether that's a picture of holiness, whether it's just a picture of that whole concept of being aged, being ancient, that he's been around since the beginning, either way, you can't get away from looking at the ancient of days and saying, wow. That's God. And then he opens the books. 
first instinct when you think about the concept that one day you have to stand before God and he's going to open the books. What's your first instinct? For many, I think even Christians, it's a little fear. There's a little jitter. There's a little nervousness. There's a little, well, what's going to be in there? I mean, just, just my chapter of the book, how big is that going to be? The things I've done that I don't even remember anymore, that has, have they been kept track of? The things I've done that I certainly do remember and still feel crummy about it. The things I haven't done that I should have done. And there's probably a million of those a day. They're probably in there too, aren't they? Do I really want him to open that book? Do, do, as we talk to the campus students on, on Thursday, you know, do we want God to put, just pick one of us here and let's put it all on a PowerPoint and just start running through it. Let's open the book and see everything you've ever done, good or bad. And you say, well, you know, yeah, the campus students, they should be nervous because at that age, 18 to 22, you're really doing some stuff you shouldn't be doing. But, you know, maybe it's even worse the older we get. We should know better, but we do it anyway. And you keep going slide by slide by slide. Who would come back next week if it was their life put up there? He'd be ashamed. He'd be embarrassed. Is that what's going to happen when God opens the books? Is that what we're going to see? Is that what the whole world's going to see as they stand there watching? How did he end that section from Matthew 25? Then the righteous will enter into eternal life. The righteous. That's you. When the book is opened, all those stains and blemishes and wrinkles that you think might be in there, they're not. With you there is forgiveness, therefore you're feared. And instead, what's on your record is the record of Jesus Christ. For all the times you've been greedy, he never was. For all the times you've been arrogant, he never was. For all the times you've lusted, he never did. For all the times you've put things before God and neighbor, he always loved God and neighbor perfectly. And how can I say that? How do I know? Because God tells us, as clear of a promise as you can get in Romans 4, God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. So go ahead, open the books. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Because our names are written in the book of life. Daniel tells us as we think about Judgment Day, thousands upon thousands were attending him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. A picture of the angels, right? Matthew says that too. Jesus is going to come back with the angels. We're told in Scripture he's going to use the angels to gather the elect from the four corners of the earth. You hear, think about Jesus saying, the angels who are always before the face of our Father in heaven are watching over the little ones. How the angels must be chomping at the bit. The angels who rejoice over one sinner who repents. How they must just not be able to wait for the day to finally come where God says, all right, that's it, it's over clock is at zero, judgment day. Finally! And come down and bring God's people, gather them to be with him. And there's no more threat of sin, there's no more threat of the devil, there's no more threat of anything that could harm our body or our soul. Finally, Lord, it's time. Let's go get them. And they'll join us and they'll be worshiping us with you and the Father and the Holy Spirit, Savior, finally. What a day that's going to be for the angels. We're told fire is involved. His throne is flaming with fire. Its wheels are ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out before him. Talking to Fred this morning, our local forester, and make sure my info was correct. You've heard of such a thing as a c controlled burn. You think of fire, maybe the first thing you think of is, oh, fire destroys things, right? Fire, you use it to burn stuff up, and it leaves destruction in its wake. Yeah, but it also can cleanse, right? That a forester can use fire to, to, to get rid of invasive species, to get rid of things that don't help the, 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 the acorns, whatever it may be, to put roots into the ground because there's litter and there's things in the way. Use a fire to cleanse what's there and to start it anew. And isn't that the picture of what's going to happen on Judgment Day? The fire of God. Not just destroying, but cleansing. 
Peter tells us in his second letter, the heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. The earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Why? Because the world is groaning as in pains of childbirth, just like all of us are. Everything has been affected by sin. The world needs to be done away with so God can start it anew and create a new heavens and a new earth, a heavenly Eden for you and for me to dwell in forever. So you think of Judgment Day. Last Judgment Sunday. What are your, what are your thoughts? I, th- I suppose there's three camps. You could be in the camp of, I don't like to think about it, it's scary. I try not to think. These are, this is the one Sunday I get uncomfortable. I don't want to talk about judgment and fire. Ugh. The middle camp is maybe indifferent. I know it's going to happen. I it'll happen when it happens. Nothing I can do about it, so I don't want to think about it. The third camp. Come quickly, Lord. I hope today's the day. Can it be today? Can you come today and put an end to all this misery and take us to Jerusalem the Golden, to the halls of Zion? Take us to be with you forever. Is today the day, Lord? Is there anything possibly that I haven't done here that is so important that I want to wait another day than not to be with you in heaven right now? I'd be amazed to hear what it may be that would trump heavenly glory. I think you and I know there's nothing. But until that day, whenever it may come, like a thief in the night, what do we do? Well, we do what Daniel did. We proclaim. Because we know that when that day comes, there will be people on his left. And as you read that section from Matthew 25, one of the worst words in all of Scripture. It's the reality, but just you think about it. Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. No more mercy. No more love. No more God. And that day is coming. And while we're still here holding the keys to heaven in our hands, holding Jesus and what he's done, when we come into contact with this world, may the first thought on our mind be, are they ready? And if not, what can I do to help make them ready? And Lord, use me with whatever gifts you've given me so that they too can say on that last day, Lord, open the books. Because in Jesus... I've been made right with you. To that end, help us, Lord. Until you come again, amen. Please stand.